Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Morty and Glory video. In today's episode, I am going to be giving my hot take on how every single faction in Warhammer 40k has been impacted by the new Arcs of Omen update. Now, before we crack on with today's video, I just want to say that everything is still very much in the melting pot. These changes are incredibly fresh, and we don't yet know 100% how everything is going to pan out. But what I can state with confidence straight off the bat is that Arcs of Omen is going to radically change the game of Warhammer 40k. The landscape will not be the same as it has been for the last 12 months. The factions that are on top now are likely to be taken down a peg. Some of the bottom feeders are likely to have been brought up into a seriously more powerful position. It remains to be seen exactly how each faction is going to improvise, adapt and overcome to their new set of circumstances. But whatever happens, I can guarantee you that we are entering a radically different and exciting new era of the game. In my opinion, and you can take this to be my first hot take, we have not seen such a reordering of the balance of power. We have not seen such a change in the faction tier lists since the shift from 8th edition to 9th edition 40k. That's how big I think these changes are. That's how different I think the game is about to become. And with that very bold statement made, let's dive straight into today's episode. So the first faction we are going to take a look at is the Harlequins, the funny space Eldar clowns. Since their 9th edition codex, Harlequins have been the terror of the meta and they have been performing very, very well. But with the recent updates, I honestly think that not only could Harlequins be in a tricky position, but they might actually be in the toilet, round the U-bend and out contaminating your local water source. The biggest change affecting Harlequins is the fact that fundamentally all of their invulnerable saves just got worse by one. That means that army-wide Harlequins are only rocking a 5 plus invulnerable save. This is absolutely massive and, and in my opinion just tanks the faction back to the dark ages. The difference between a 4 plus invulnerable save and a 5 plus invulnerable save may not seem like a huge amount on paper but in reality it is a huge change. 4 plus invulnerable saves often have the ability to spike and sometimes if your opponent just gets a lucky run of the dice he will tank just shot after shot after shot on his 4 plus save. But a 5 plus invulnerable save is a lot less reliable and it's going to make the Harlequins an incredibly fragile faction. Now there are some people out there saying that Harlequins can still perform very well because they can get great scoring potential and their killing power hasn't been affected in any way, shape or form. They're just as deadly as they always have been. Whilst this may be true, Harlequin players are probably going to have to be a lot more cagey, circling around the edges of the battlefield and trying to score their secondaries without interacting with their opponents very much. Not only is this going to make the faction a lot less fun to play, which is going to cause a lot of players to shift away from them. I mean, who wants to play an army that you don't even really interact with the person on the other side of the board? You're just sort of playing your own little game. That's just not fun for anyone involved. But also, by becoming more cerebral and requiring more careful thought and planning, you're going to see Harlequins drop away from the competitive scene. Even if Harlequins are just as good as they always have been, they just require a different style of play, a little bit more thought and precision, you're going to see top tier players dropping them what you have to remember is if you're a top tier player the kind of person that's going to go out there and try and win gts or even super majors you need an army that can get you the most wins for the least amount of brain power it's important to remember that a lot of super majors involve players who want to win the event having to go through eight games of 40k and if you've got a faction that's going to be sapping your mental stamina at every single point you might get into that final and just be like a brain dead zombie that means you're going to start making mistakes and it's going to be harder for you to win the event or you could pick a faction that is just as powerful but way easier to pilot and when you get to that final game you are relatively mentally refreshed and ready for the fight and you're going to be able to take advantage of your opponent who might be using Harlequins or another more complicated faction. That is why I believe Harlequins are going to drop because they're going to be a lot less fun for people to use 
and they're going to take a lot more brain power, which is going to cause competitive players to drop the faction. Now, the next faction that we're going to take a look at is the Adeptus Mechanicus. And I personally believe that these guys are resurgent and they are going to be back with a vengeance. The two most important changes that are affecting Admech is that they are now getting a 5 plus invulnerable save across the army. Anything that has got bionics is going to go from having a 6 plus save to a 5 plus save. This is frankly an insanely good buff for the Admech and you are going to see Skatari Horde armies making a big comeback. It's important to take into account that Admech have had pretty much all of the nerfs applied to the army walked back. So you are playing against an Admech force now that is going to be just as good as they were on release and now they've been made even better. Skatari may have lost their veteran cohort because the Army of Renown books are no longer allowed for match play, but you are essentially getting veteran Skatari with these enhanced bionics with this new 5 plus invulnerable save army wide. It's kind of crazy to think about, but Harlequins have just gone down to a 5 plus invulnerable save and Admech have just gone up to a 5 plus invulnerable save. So the whole thing about Harlequins being, oh, you've got invulnerable saves army wide just became like not even a unique selling point anymore because if you were going to collect an army that you wanted to have a good and vulnerable save across the board you might as well go admech now rather than harlequins but that's not all the admech got their cataphron battle services the little tractor boys with the guns for arms have now gained the core keyword this is a really important change because it does mean that those cataphron battle services are now going to have access to a whole smorgasbord of buffs i mean right off the bat it finally means they can start re-rolling ones to hit and to wound and all that kind of good stuff and i think you're gonna see the battle services become a lot more popular it remains to be seen if Skatari hordes are going to make a comeback or if people are going to start buying up the cataphron battle services but i think at first we'll probably see a return to Skatari hordes because a lot of players who bought those armies at the beginning of ninth are probably still sitting on them they've probably still got the models in the boxes somewhere but i think in the future we may see more people starting to pick up those cat from battle servitors and seeing a bit more of a balanced army which is made up of both Skatari and admech forces but with all that said i'm not totally convinced that you're going to see admech armies starting to win super majors left right and center i think they'll be able to comfortably win local gts and rtts and you might see them taking the occasional important quite big gt but i'm not quite sure they are back to their original release levels of filth the reason for this is twofold Firstly, one of the big things that made Admech so oppressive on release was the fact that they could spam flyers. And in fact, it was the Skatari flyers that were the main reason that GW introduced the rule of two for the planes. Flyers are still limited to only two, which means that you're not going to see those awfully oppressive and horrendous Skatari airborne lists coming back into the fray. But even more important than that, Frankly, I just think the meta has moved on since the original release of the Admech. When they first dropped, they were one of only a handful of factions that had a 9th edition codex. Basically, the beginning of 9th edition was just Marine Codex after Marine Codex after Marine Codex coming out, and then Dark Elder, and then Admech. But since then, pretty much every faction in 40k has received their new Codex. A lot of factions are in a much better spot than they once were. And so I think, relatively, Admech are going to settle into a nice B-plus tier position in the meta. But moving on, now let's take a look at the Chaos Demon Boys, and they have caught a bit of a nerf. Flamers of Zinch no longer auto-hit. That means that they're going to have to roll to hit, and they only have a ballistic skill of 4+. This is a really significant and interesting update to the faction. It's significant because a lot of demon players were leaning heavily into flamers and they were one of the more hated faction units for the chaos demons. A lot of people have been clamoring for flamer nerfs since the chaos demon codex dropped. They are considered to be quite oppressive. I think flamer nerfs were inevitable, but I don't think anyone saw Games Workshop going in this direction. A lot of the solutions that I saw people proposing was to limit the unit size to a maximum of three or to give them a pretty hefty points increase. But Games Workshop didn't do either of these traditional balancing mechanisms and instead 
instead they went for something a lot more interesting because it's got some pretty big implications we as far as i can remember we've never seen games workshop fundamentally alter a weapon profile like this before it's just a fact of life in 40k that flamers auto hit it doesn't matter if it's a hand flamer a regular flamer or a heavy flamer. It doesn't matter which faction it is if it's a flamer type weapon it auto hits but now that's no longer the case and a precedent has been set for games workshop to tweak weapon profiles of other things as well but however you slice it one of the most powerful units in the demon codex just caught a big old nerf bat to the face and we're gonna have to see how demon players pivot and what other concoctions they come up with to adapt to their new circumstances next up we have the eldari the old pointy ears and they've had a nice little boost to their fire and fade stratagem it used to be only once per game but now it can be used every single turn if the Eldar want to. For those of you that don't know what Fire and Fade does, it allows an Eldar player to shoot with a unit and then move with it afterwards. This means that they could move out from behind cover in their movement phase. They can then pop off some shots in the shooting phase, then spend the CP on Fire and Fade and move that unit back behind the cover. Essentially, it allows them to jump, shoot, jump and shoot at their opponents with impunity and without the risk of retaliatory fire. Personally, I have kind of mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, it is a nice boost for the Eldar. It will be something that I think a lot of those players are going to be taking advantage of. But on the other hand, jump, shoot, jump mechanics are very frustrating and a lot of players do not like them. The main problem I have with it is that the traditional counter to jump, shoot, jump, to fire and fade kind of stratagems and maneuvers is indirect fire. Because it doesn't matter if you want to jump, shoot, jump, I'm going to land some artillery shots on your head and i don't need to be able to see you to do that but as you know games workshop has heavily nerfed indirect fire in ninth edition and without the ability to have good indirect fire a lot of factions just won't really have any way of trying to counter this cheeky tactic assault armies might be all right because they can breach through walls and move forward and just get in amongst them and chop them up but for shooty armies it might become very annoying trying to deal with the elder after the elder we have the chaos space marines and they have had a big nerf to one of their sub factions the creations of bile fight on death has been majorly toned down in fact it no longer automatically goes off instead you have to roll a four plus to see if you fight on death and even if you do you count as only having one wound which is important for those units that degrade with the less wounds they have creation of the bile was without a doubt one of the strongest sub factions that the heretic authorities had available to them and it was the cornerstone to a lot of their competitive builds with this change i think you're going to find that creations of bile is dead on arrival and we're going to have to see what chaos spaceman players can do to move into a new style of play i have heard that some of the new chaos space marine secondaries allow them to pull off some really cool shenanigans but overall i am wondering if the creation of the bow crutch being kicked out from under them is going to cause a bit of a decline in the faction this nerf comes at the same time that armor of contempt is being removed from the game so not only is the main combat punch of the chaos space marines being toned down but also their overall durability is taken Taking a big hit as well on the plus side their legionnaires do now get access to some free war gear and this could mean that we start seeing the rise of some old school traitor legions with big blocks of chaos space marines moving around the battlefield with very points efficient loadouts next up we have the true emperor's finest the imperial guard the astra militarum the regular humans of the Imperium received no major changes or updates in the balanced data slate. Basically, our codex has only just dropped, and so they're not messing with it yet. But officially, the Guard Codex isn't out for release yet, along with the rest of the models. We've had KD stands, but we've not had the standalone codex available for general purchase. So there may still be some nerfs in our future. We all know that Games Workshop likes to do a cheeky little two-week FAQ after many codexes drop. But for now, no changes is good news for the boys in green. And I think Guard are going to be in a position to really take advantage of the new lay of the land. I mean, we 
we are entering into a shooty meta. If you look at the factions that have been nerfed, you look at the factions that have been buffed, it's pretty clear that we're going to be seeing the rise of more hordy armies and also a lot more shooting is going to be taking place. Well, I have said this for a long time, but if you want a good horde shooty army, in fact, if you want the best one, you should be looking at the guard. Combine this with the fact that Arm of Contempt has gone the way of the Dodo and guard has easy access to high AP or AP boosting capabilities across the army. And I think that those Marine Horde armies that are being predicted are going to melt away quickly in the face of a guard firestorm. Now, whilst our codex hasn't been updated, our secondary objectives have had a couple of big changes. Firstly, special orders has gone. The only secondary objectives that you have that are faction specific are by Lasgun and Bayonet, Boots on the Ground and Inflexible Command. I'm really sad about this change. I like Special Orders and I found that if you built into it and got good at using that secondary, you could get 10 points in it fairly easily every game. In contrast, if they were going to get rid of one secondary, I would have preferred if they got rid of by Lasgun and Ben. It really just isn't very good. You don't tend to score more than six or seven. If you're lucky, you might get eight points on it. And so it's just not a very good pick. So essentially, Guard don't have three secondaries to pick from. Realistically, you only have two and that's going to be boots on the ground and inflexible command and then you're going to have to decide what the heck you're going to do for your third one on the other hand inflexible command which was already our best secondary and was pretty much an easy 14 15 points every game just got even better i'm not going to lie to you boys if you're not maxing out a flexible command by turn three at the latest by turn four, then something has gone horribly wrong for you. The new inflexible command allows you to score two victory points if your infantry are within six inches of your officer. Of course, if you've got box casters, then that could be 24 inches of your officer, just like it is now. You could also score a victory point if your tanks are within 12 inches of your officers as well. What's really important to know here is that it's no longer a requirement for tanks to be in range of tank officers tanks just need to be in range of any officer that means if you've got a bunch of Lehman Russes within 12 inches of a Caden Castellan they will still count towards your inflexible command points this makes it much easier and ironically means that it's not very inflexible at all but the icing on the cake is the third part of inflexible command got even better and the third part is if you kill a unit with one of your units, whilst it is under the influence of an order, you score points. Now, it used to be you scored a point and they've changed it. So now you score two points. That means it is very easy to score five points a turn with inflexible command. That is just bonkers and there was also another small little buff to mention in that boots on the ground got a little bit easier to do as well you no longer have to be over six inches away from the center of the board you can just be three inches from the center of the board and in each table quarter but long story short guys you are going to be taking a flexible command every single game without a shadow of a doubt and you're probably going to be taking boots on the ground every single game as well and you're going to have to have a bit of a tricky time deciding what that third one is but just build around it if you're taking some primary psychers or other psychic power doers in your army you might want to lean into the warpcraft ones but for me personally i'm looking at banners as my third secondary we're just going to have to see what the arcs of omen missions are like my hot take on the guard secondaries is that I think they really should have just left Inflexible Command how it was and instead made boots on the ground actually worth taking. If they made it so it was like two points per unit or you get one point for killing an enemy unit and another point for if they kill an enemy unit that was on an objective or something like that, that would have made it a bit more useful. But as it is, they've improved the secondary that was already very good. Um, they've improved our boots on the ground that was already pretty good. And now guard is going to be back in that a bit annoying situation where you've got to try and pick a tricky third secondary. So not the way I would have done it, but hell, at the end of the day, guard are in a great position. And overall, our secondaries just got much better. So not much really to complain about, boys. Guard are top tier now. Yep, I think so. After Guard, we have the Tyranids. And sadly for the Cosmic Horrors, they are continuing their downward 
spiral nid came out of the gate so strong one of the top armies in 40k one of the most powerful codexes we've seen in a long time and they have just been hit by round after round after round of nerfs First off, their mana scepters got taken out back. Then they started having trickiness with Leviathan not being as good anymore. And I think a lot of Tuna players thought, right, we've had two rounds of nerf. There's no way we can surely catch a third nerf bat. But here comes Games Workshop with the steel chair and with some pretty big nerfs for the Space Gribblies. First off, Overrun has been changed so you can no longer use it on your Hive Tyrants. Having the Jump Shoot Jump Hive Tyrant was a pretty big part of a lot of competitive Tyranid tactics and now they can't do it. It's kind of crazy that, you know, Eldar are getting their Jump Shoot Jump abilities uh, improved but Tyranids are having theirs nerfed. Just seems a little bit unfair. But the real kick to the nuts for the Nids is the points increases they have received. And the most relevant one is Zonathropes just got a 40% points hike. They went from 50 points per model to 70 points a pop. My hot take on the Tyranids is you are not going to see them running their Zonathrope hordes anymore. And it's kind of interesting to see how much Tyranids have had to pivot since their codex has been released. At first, it was all about the Mala Scepters. Then that got taken away from them. Then it was all about Turned Warrior Spam. That got taken out back. Then they moved on to Zone of Throat Spam. Gone. Harpies have also caught a nerf as well. So they're in the toilet. So realistically, a lot of the most powerful things and the big tools that Nids had in their toolbox are no longer really viable. I think we're going to see a lot of Nid players now pivot into more horde and little bug spam lists the gaunts and gants didn't get any changes so relatively they got much better within that codex i think it's going to be cool to see the return of tyranid swarm list it is a traditional and favorite one of the community as crazy as it sounds as tyranids were really top dog for a long time i do think that if they're gonna have to be forced down to the little bug to the swarm route that maybe games workshop should consider either taking a point off termagants and hormigants or giving them access to some free war gifts and free adrenal glands and toxin sacs might go a long way to soothing the pain of the Tony community. But even without those proposed changes, we are definitely staring down the barrel of Tyranid Swarm List. And from the fleshiest of factions over to the faction that probably has the least flesh involved of any army in 40k, it's time to take a look at the Necrons. Necrons have had a little bit of a roller coaster ride in 9th edition. They started off with a pretty weak codex, but successively Games Workshop has laid more and more buffs onto them until it got to the point where Necrons were actually a top tier army that you are being seen used by a lot of great players unfortunately for the tim boys this time round, games workshop has gone in a different direction and rather than buffing the necrons further they've actually toned them down the main downgrade here is you can no longer combine the pre-game move with the Everything Gets Obsec Dynasty. This is going to really reduce the mobility of Necron armies and is also going to make it harder for them to achieve their secondaries. And the secondaries was one of the things that was really making Necrons so top tier. On the plus side, Necrons did get a few points changes here and there in their favour. For example, Necron Warriors got better and so did the Ghost Arcs. If I was to make a bold prediction, I would say that Necron players are going to move away from Scorepec Destroyer spam and move away from the Obsec and pre-game move dynasty and instead we're going to start seeing Silver Tide making a triumphant return. Big blocks of warriors are incredibly tough when fully supported and buffed up and now that they've got cheaper it's even easier to do that. Sticking with the precious metal theme we are going to go from silver over to gold and take a look at the Adeptus Custodes. The Golden Banana Boys were in a bit of a strange place in 9th edition. They had a pretty high win rate, 55%, but that was pretty much entirely dependent upon a single army list type, which is where you just spammed as many Dreadnoughts as possible. 
outside of the dread spam list custodies actually had a pretty low win rate and they were actually struggling quite badly so games workshop has taken it upon themselves to try and hand out some nerfs to the wider custodian community and to improve the variety of lists we're going to see from the golden horde the first big change that they have made is now all custodies core infantry gets objective secured that is going to be a big boost to the terminators and i think we're going to see a lot of terminators being fielded in competitive custodies lists going forward another big change is the once per game limits on some of their most powerful stratagems has been removed these two changes walk back to of the biggest nerfs that custodies have received in the past and whilst i am glad to see the golden boys getting a little bit of love and i am going to welcome seeing some list variety on the tabletop i can't help but be concerned it's easy to forget that when custodies first dropped they were incredibly powerful in fact they were at one point the most powerful faction in 40k and i'm just concerned that we might be going back to those days but we'll have to wait and see if it pans out like with the ad mech the meta has moved on and now a lot more factions do have their codexes perhaps custodies will actually end up settling into a nice position we've talked about silver We've talked about gold, but we haven't talked about the mightiest of materials, rust. Let's take a look at the Death Guard. My hot take is that Death Guard have received a bit of a side grade, and we are going to see some minor changes to their army lists. The big change to Death Guard is, like every other power armored bloke out there, they have lost Armor of Contempt. This is going to make a big difference to their durability. And Death Guard's whole shtick is that they are tough. So nerfing that does have quite a big impact on the faction. But on the other hand, Death Guard did get some pretty nice points cuts. Plague Marines went down from 21 points a pop to 19. That's only one point more than a Chaos Space Marine Legionnaire. Plague Marines also already had access to free war gear. So now that you're spending only 190 points per 10-man squad and you can load them up so pretty much every single guy in that squad has got some kind of special weapon or combat upgrade, I really do think that Plague Marine Hordes could be something we see start hitting the battlefield in big numbers. The other direction we may see Death Guard players going is to really heavily lean into Blight Lords. Blight Lords didn't get any cheaper, but they do now get lots of free war gear. Taking three maxed out bricks of Blight Lord Terminators with 10 men in each squad and all of the upgrades now that they're free, is only going to cost you 1,200 points. That leaves loads of points left over to get them all these support characters they might need and also a few cheap chaff units to hold objectives. I don't know about you guys, but the idea of facing down 30 Blight Lords, even with my guard and all of their fantastic firepower, is a very scary proposition and not something that I am looking forward to. Moving on from the Death Guard, we have got the Adeptus Astartes, the Angels of Death themselves, the Space Marines. So Space Marines are in a really strange spot right now. And despite the fact that losing Armor of Contempt feels like it should have nerfed them back to the Stone Age, I actually think that Marines might be coming out even stronger after all of the latest updates you see marines have had two really important updates the first one is they no longer need to move through the different combat doctrines if you want to stay in devastate doctrine the whole game you can do if you get the tactical and you want to sit there that's absolutely fine so no longer a marine player's fighting against the clock where they feel like jesus christ i need to get this game wrapped up by turn three because i really have not got an army built for the assault doctrine that's just not the case anymore they can just sit in their preferred doctrine this is really going to supercharge some of the marine chapters like iron hands and imperial fists both of which have been in the toilet 
ever since Games Workshop said they had to go out of Devastate Doctrine in turn two. So it's going to be crazy, but it might feel like we back in eighth edition now, boys, with Imperial Fist armies running around all over the place and Iron Hands resurgent once more back onto the battlefield. Another chapter that seems like it's going to do really well out of these combat doctrine changes is the Ultramarines. Finally, they can sit in their tactical doctrine throughout the whole game. Just a little side note here, but Ultramarines have done kind of okay throughout 9th edition. While some of the other chapters have really waxed and waned, they always seem to have had some pretty decent play. If I was an Ultramarine player, I'd be pretty satisfied with how my chapters held up over the last three years. I cannot overstate how big a fundamental change this is for the Marine factions. We are going to see overnight a move away from combat oriented chapters chapters into shooting focus ones and I think once again this is another step on the path to us entering into a very shooty epoch of 40k and moving away from that combat focus that has really dominated a lot of 9th edition. But that's not all because the Angels of Death have received a second incredibly powerful update to their army which is they have had some pretty significant point cuts and on top of that, free war gear for pretty much everyone in their codex. That's right. Games Workshop have trialed free war gear with several other factions like the Imperial Guard and Death Guard. And now they are giving it out to the Sons of the Emperor. The immediate impact of this is Space Moon Armies just got dirt cheap. I have heard multiple reports of Space Moon Armies getting 400 to 500 points cheaper. Just the same list, just getting a 25% points reduction overall. That is insane. That is bonkers. That is going to be such a shot in the arm for the faction. I mean, just to give you guys a couple of examples off the top of my head, Stern Guard veterans now get free combi plasmas on everyone. That means you can take a 10-man squad of Stern Guard, which at rapid fire range is going to put out 20 plasma shots and 20 bolt shots, all of that for just 200 points. You've got the plasma inceptors, which are now going to only cost 40 points a pop. And then on top of that, you've got a lot of the Space Marine vehicles getting cheaper as well. Some of the Gladiator tanks can be taken for as cheap as 125 points. And they are basically Space Marine Lehman Russes. Combine this all together, the loss of Armor of Contempt, the free war gear, the serious point reductions, and the ability for Space Marine players to stay in whatever combat doctrine they want. And I think we are going to see the rise of some big marine horde armies. Each marine is going to die like shit. They are going to get blown off the table left, right and centre, but there are just going to be so many of them coming out of the woodwork. I would not be surprised if most marine armies start getting seriously filled up with some firstborn, spamming out lots of cheap special weapons. If you see marine players running 70, 80 or even 90 infantry in their list, that would not be a surprise to me in any way, shape or form. I think what's going to be kind of cool is we might see firstborn infantry taking the lead but primaris armor backing them up because not only have the gladiators got cheaper but the repulsors also seem to have some very favorable points costs now if marine horde armies are going to be on the rise then i think we could see black templars become one of the premier marine chapters out there they are fundamentally a horde marine army black templar tide has been a staple of that faction for a long time and when you start putting the numbers together you are seeing black templar hordes that can be easily hitting 120 power armored bodies not even breaking a sweat but on a total opposite end of the spectrum, I also think that certain chapters like the Dark Angels are really going to be able to lean into their Terminators and their Bikers. The Deathwing and the Raven Ring both received some pretty significant points costs, and I think you could easily see Deathwing armies running 40 plus Terminators, all of them with their inbuilt permanent transhuman. What might counter this 
is how prevalent that the leagues of Votan become. Because it doesn't matter if you've got permanent transhuman, if your opponent is just also wounding you on force the whole time, then you might not see those Deathwing boys make a comeback. Now, if the Marines are making a comeback, then the Drukhari are just treading water desperately. They received no major nerfs or buffs in this update. Now, for major card players, they might breathe a sigh of relief. Their faction has been slowly but surely eroded and nerfed over the course of 9th edition, and I'd say they're probably still paying for the fact that they were one of the first powerful codexes to come out. But the thing is, is that if you get a side grade and a lot of other people are getting upgrades, then relatively speaking, you might have ended up with a downgrade but speaking of downgrades sisters of battle are in a really tricky spot right now they lost armor of contempt and they got no free war gear or significant points changes because if marines are gonna die like shit without arm contempt you can just imagine that whole bricks of sisters are gonna get picked up in very short order i mean i don't care if you've got a three plus save if you're only toughness three and one wound, you are going to get mown down by everything from shooters, las guns, plasma, just any gun in the game is going to pick you up without even breaking a sweat. So if Sisters of Battle are going to die even easier than Marines are, and once you take into account that you have to pay for all of their upgrades, they're going to cost a very similar amount to their big boy Marine brethren. Really, why would you be picking Sisters at this point? I honestly think that without Arm of Contempt and without Free War Gear, Sisters of Battle really are just the poor man's Marine Army. And if all this wasn't enough, GW decided to go ahead and rub some salt in the wound, and now the Sisters Secondaries have also been overall downgraded. Defend the Shrine has stayed the same, which is alright. Uh, Slay the Heretic was removed, but the ones that have been downgraded is Sacred Ground now only nets you four victory points, and a leap of faith has been completely completely reworked requiring you to have to expend miracle dice to try and score victory points and it's still capped at 12 vp a pop so i'm just not convinced that sisters are in a good spot right now at all next up we have the orcs and by and large the football hooligan mushroom lads remained unchanged there were some minor bits here and there but the big thing that's changed for orcs is the lack of arm of contempt on everybody else this is going to mean that choppers are back on the menu and i've heard a lot of orc players getting excited for being able to run their green tides again I'm not sure we'll see a return of Green Tide. Whilst the chopper is back on the menu, whilst it will actually be able to do some damage to the opponents in close combat, the problem with Green Tide is not necessarily the chopper AP situation, but is actually rather that Orcs really struggle with morale. Mob rule is not what it once was, and I think even if you were to run three or four or even five big 30-man blobs of Orcs, you are going to be taking a lot of casual to morale on the way in i could be wrong i would love to see a return of the green tide but i don't think choppers getting a bit better is enough to bring back the hordes of orcs another faction that did not receive very many updates was the tau empire their crisis suits are kind of expensive but in a funny sort of way i think despite the fact that the tau remained unchanged relatively speaking they are poised to do very well in the future 40k meta and the reason for that is we are entering a shooting era. I've said it multiple times, guys. And if you are a faction, that whole thing is shooting the crap out of your enemy, then surely you're going to be in a good spot. So I think that Tau are poised to be able to take advantage of the new meta. I think they can bring a lot of guns to bear. They've got good mobility. And yeah, their Christ suits may be kind of expensive now, but they have lots of other options that they can maneuver into to adapt and get ready for the new shooting gallery. And continuing with this trend of factions that did not get changed very much, Grey Knights seem to have been completely forgotten about 
by Games Workshop. And that is a big shame. Great Knights were already struggling a little bit and you were seeing them less and less around the tournament water cooler. But now the fact that they've lost Armor of Contempt and received no point changes or free war gear means that relatively speaking, they are probably one of the weaker Imperial factions and weaker Marine-like factions out there at the moment. In my opinion, Games Workshop needs to let Grey Knight spam Smite again. I think that every Grey Knight squad should be able to cast Smite, but it should only do one mortal wound, but that it should only ever cost them a warp charge value of five. I think that would allow them to feel a bit more unique, not just like Silver Marines. And it's rather than giving them free war gears, you're kind of giving them free Smites. And I think overall, that would be a welcome addition to the Grey Knight roster. And I think the Grey Knight community would like that. As it is, that's just my opinion. They've not got that, and so they are not looking very spicy at all. They look like a plain curry to me. Another psychic faction that Games Workshop seems to have forgotten about is the Thousand Suns. Thousand Suns are in a bit of a weird position because they lost Arm of Contempt, which means they're less durable, and they didn't get any real points, costs, reductions, or free war gear. So they are now some of the more expensive power armored lads out there. But their basic bolters are AP minus two. And a lot of their standard weapons do come with a very respectable AP value. So relatively speaking, they kind of became a bit anti-meta and became a bit more powerful. Overall, though, I think we're going to have to wait and see where the Thousand Suns end up. I'm not feeling super positive about them myself. Um, we'll have to see if the reduction in their own durability and their relative priciness is going to be uh, made up for by the fact that their basic weapons are now pretty good. Next up, we have the Imperial and Chaos Knights. And I'm lumping these guys together because they are fairly similar and neither faction received any important changes. The big thing that's going to impact them is, of course, Armor of Contempt going away. I think a lot of Night players are going to be kind of smug about that. I know that that community was not happy that their big super stompy robots didn't get Armor of Contempt and all these little dudes running around did. With AP reduction being a thing of the past, a lot of the Night weapons are going to get much better. The Gatling guns are probably going to see a bit of a resurgence and so are the rapid fire battle cannons. My take on the situation is that Knights overall are going to be in a better position and this is for three reasons. Firstly, their own weapons relatively just got better. Like I said, the Gatling Cannon and Battle Cannon are going to do much more effectively now. On top of that, Knights are fundamentally a shooting army. They can stomp around and you might see the occasional one with the chainsaw and stuff. But by and large, the majority of Knight damage comes from their firepower. Uh, and thirdly, a lot of the weapons that were being taken by armies that were quite good against knights are probably going to become a little bit rarer. What I mean by this is if we're seeing the rise of a horde meta, then a lot of people are going to start taking things like heavy bolters. Whereas before we were in an elite meta and people were going big or going home and taking a lot of melter and las cannons. So if the general shift is towards lots of little shots rather than big anti-tank shots, knights should be able to enjoy that situation. The penultimate faction that I want to talk about that has been skulking around in the shadows of this video is the Gene Stealer Cult. Now, overall, the cult didn't receive any huge bunker-busting, ground-shaking changes, but they have been pushed in a slightly new direction. Many of their combat units have stayed the same or had minor tweaks, but their neophyte hybrids, their guardsmen equivalents, have received some pretty good free war gear now. Being able to take big blocks of 20 neophytes and give them four free grenade launchers and four free heavy stubbers is going to generate a hell of a lot of DACA. And that kind of loadout is probably going to become more relevant as well as we enter into this more hoardy meta that we've been talking about. 
Combine this with the fact that cult icons just got their points costs cut in half and they're now only 10 points per unit. And we could see some big neophyte wannabe guardsmen armies coming out from the cultist community. One really fun minor change is that the cash of demolition charges for your vehicles no longer costs you any points. This is going to be important to remember if you're facing off against Gene Silicon, because what the cash of demo charges allows them to do is not only get some close range like battle cannon like shots, but it also means that if you destroy their vehicle for one command point, they can auto explode it. So if you see a Gene Silicon player running one of his trucks towards you, getting it amongst your lines, it's like, he's only got one wound. Why is he doing that? He's probably launching it into you as a bit of a bomb truck. So just be aware of that sneaky trick they now have up there. Their sleeves. Overall, I would say that Jeans de la Colt are actually in a pretty good position. They have received some small yet meaningful points cuts, they've started getting some free war gear, and many of the units that have been improved are their shooty ones, which is good for the upcoming DACA meta. I think a lot of people forget that one of the most important rules that the GSC have access to is crossfire. And whilst traditionally a lot of people have seen them as a fast, fragile melee horde, I think that shooty gene stealer cult lists have always been something that the cult have got in their back pocket. And I think they may start playing that card. And last but certainly not least we have the dwarves in space the leagues of votan the diggy diggy hole fan club remains almost completely unchanged there were no meaningful point costs or free war gear their secondaries weren't changed that much although one of them was removed and they had none of their rules updated nerfed or buffed i'm not gonna lie to you guys i'm not thrilled about this and the blatant votan cash grab seems to be continuing with Games Workshop giving everyone the ability to take a cheeky Votan patrol and them not touching them despite the fact that they are a very efficient and effective faction, I think it just means that Votan are going to be in a position to become the new top dog of 40k. I mean, Votan got to keep Arm of Contempt when everyone else lost it because they have Void Armor and that's baked into their codex. So... They just got more durable than everyone else around them. And we're about to enter into a shooting meta with an army that can auto wound its enemies on four pluses to shoot. I mean, that's just not, not a good situation to be in. And what you have to remember on top of all this is that one of the weaknesses that Votan had was a lack of indirect fire. They could get like some one shot missiles on their land fortresses. But Games Workshop just put the final nail in the coffin of artillery because now Guard no longer have their exception, which means you are not going to see much indirect fire at all. Therefore, most people are going to be getting into straight up firefights and that is the situation that Votan want to force. They want to force you to get into a direct slugging match with them because they're going to outlast you and then they're going to outshoot you. In summary, I think Votan are going to be well placed to be the new top dog of the 40k meta. They're going to have more durability than everyone else. They are going to have more firepower than everybody else. The only thing that they have going against them is the fact that most people just got a lot cheaper and a bit more hoardy and Votan are staying basically the same. And they did get quite expensive with their initial nerf. But that is it, guys. That is my hot take on every every single faction in 40k right now however you slice it we are entering into a new meta that is going to be radically different from the old one but let me know what you think down in the comment section below is there anything that i've said that you agree with or strongly disagree with let me know and get your arguments down in that comment section if you've enjoyed today's video then make sure you smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode and if you've really enjoyed today's video or you have found it particularly interesting then please consider becoming a channel member or patreon supporter one of the biggest perks you get for becoming a channel member or patreon is access to the mordian glory discord server this is an online community of well over 800 
active members. There's always someone to chat to in there, be that about tactics, meta, army list, hobbying, painting, or even memes. We have a ton of really experienced players in there as well, so it can be a very useful resource for you to draw upon. And I just want to take a moment now to say a big thank you to all of the latest channel members. So thank you to Josh, Matthew Holmes, Verado255, Grim Dankness, Chris Downing, Zoltan Hughes, Nstubs88, Benjamin Klarman, Marl the Knife, and 13th Century Jackass. Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to do a shout out to the latest Patreon supporters as well. So thank you to Janet Wicks, Reese Jones, The Bane Blade, Matthew Truell, Ever7 Chun, Alex DePaz, and TS. Thank you guys for your ongoing Patreon support. And last but certainly not least, I want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are my war masters, the people that have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So I want to say a big thank you to Bon Bon Vert, Phil French, Ross Miller, Tequal, Alex Dengal, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Swordfish Trombone, Diesel Fox, Tom Sutton, and August Varney. Thank you guys. Your ongoing and generous support is a huge part of how I'm able to do Mordian Glory full time. I hope you've all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.